Okay, we're talking plates. Why do we need plates? What are plates? Who captures plates? And we're talking plates with the plate pros. This is a Cinity Gear News video supported by B and H and CVP. Hey guys, Grant Miller Sheldon here from CineD.com. Welcome back to Cine Gear 2023 here at Paramount Studios in Los Angeles, California. I'm joined by David from Plate Pros to talk about all things plates, honestly. And they've also designed some really interesting solutions that sort of uh, democratizes the plate acquiring process, for lack of a better term. So David, maybe a good spot to start is what do you guys do? What is a plate? Sure. So uh, a plate is a background environment that you're going to use for compositing. So usually, in our case, it's for driving sequences. So we're looking at um, a 360 degree moving environment that you would composite behind an actor sitting in uh, in a car on a, either a sound stage, so like an LED stage, uh, either so car stage or a, a green screen stage. Um, so that background plate gives the appearance that the actor is driving through an environment that they never may have actually visited. So it allows us to do location shooting without having to actually go to that location. And well, and David, one of the reasons that's a little tricky for say like a first unit to execute is honestly quite a number of cameras. Sometimes the first unit is on a sound stage and can't go to the location of wherever that is, but you guys are here to sort of handle that process. Yeah, so doing car process work on a stage is hugely beneficial for, for production for lots of reasons. So Quality of life for crew, everything. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more comfortable, you're in a controlled environment, you're not dealing with weather, you're not dealing with the, the, the natural environment, including people going by, honking their horn, you know, that it's snowing that day. So by working on a sound stage, you're able to keep all of that. And so the A talent actor time is the most valuable time on set. So you're trying to do everything you can to protect that. Working on a process trailer, now you're asking your A talent to sit in an unair conditioned car that's turned off and get towed around through the city. So it's more disruptive to the environment, to the local neighborhood. We're able to just drive a little car like this around once. We can resell this plate over and over and over again. So the impact to the community is a lot less and everything now is happening where it should, which is in a studio on a soundstage. So it's, it's better, faster, cheaper, and safer. Rarely do you get all those at once. Now with uh, virtual production, kind of a catch-all term, but we're seeing the need for this kind of more and more and more, not less. And it is a specialized skill set, much in the way, say, like high-speed drone underwater is, right? And it's something you, you need to understand how to do. And there also isn't really that many turnkey solutions for people out there that just want to get started on this. It all ends up being a little bit custom. So tell me, what are the types of rigs that you guys use. I understand that also you, you have a library too for other folks. I, I imagine at a lower price point to get started. Yeah, for sure. So we, our company pretty much works from two different, uh, it's almost like two companies in one. We have a production services company where we uh, deploy our rigs as a service. So you hire us, we have union and non-union trained crews, uh, both in Los Angeles and New York, and we are able to uh, either show up on an existing film set and integrate as a day player on that set, or you can send us off as a splinter unit. We'll go off on our own and we'll get an environment uh, that, that you might not need to have your entire crew show up on. So that's the custom service side of it. And then the second side is the licensing piece. We go out on our own and we film a bunch of content from all around the world and we're able to offer that as a, a downloadable stock footage library. Um, so you can go onto the website, playpros.com, uh, click on the library tab and start going through uh, our library of now fully stitched 12K 360 environments. So it's one massive file that shows you every direction, including straight up, uh, so you're able to get all of that information in one big file. So if you're dealing, like, say, say you're doing an LED virtual production volume, all of those pixels on that LED wall need content. So we've designed this to be able to provide that content in motion, fully stabilized, uh, and as simple as just a download from the internet. Yeah, so it's meant to be as turnkey as a button press, minimal interaction with your team in this process. Yeah, and for the library, it's literally just call us up. We have a kind of bespoke service. We have staff that's there to help. If you don't know what plate you want, you can tell us about your scene. We'll give you a set of options. Say, here's here's some, you know, some things that might help. Because you might be thinking, I really want this one particular back alley in Washington, D.C., not realizing that we might have something in Atlanta that actually suits the purpose better. So for us, it's more about the creative and the look and feel than like a specific street address, although we can do that too. You know, there's honestly a little bit of an education component right there that kind of needs to happen. Because we need to understand that plates, in general, very often 
are out of focus behind many, often feet away behind our talent. And if they're somehow pulling focus from the scene itself, there's a problem with the scene that doesn't have anything to do with the plate. So yeah, I see that all the time. It's like, look, we need the exact rock from Wyoming to match X. And that honestly usually isn't what uh, teams out there need. But from that perspective, what types of plates right now are in your library? Are you going for like generic city, generic forest, generic desert? Is that sort of the initial goals here? Or? Yeah, so right now the, the main focus, uh, we're in North America, so part of it is that the new rig is based on a, a, a purpose-built vehicle. Um, so we have two different versions of our array. One of them that's the purpose-built vehicle is what the new library is based on. That's giving you a seamless 360 stitch. Uh, we also have another array, that's actually the one that's off your shoulder there, that's what we call Gen 2. It's based on two separate arrays one that mounts to the front of the car, one that mounts to the back, um, and that is designed to travel. So it travels as a suitcase and two carry-on cases and can attach to a rental car anywhere in the world. It's really hard for me to bring you back Paris by Tuesday with, with a vehicle that I'd have to put on a boat. With that, we can get two crew members on a plane and we can bring you back Paris by Tuesday. So there's some trade-offs between portability and stitchability, um, but that's where we're, the new library, we're kind of focusing on the stitchability aspect because that's important for, for curved wall volume or any of the LED stages that we're seeing coming becoming popular. Um, so really the, there, there's uh, a, a dynamic on how you decide to, to which array we're using for which particular technique. Um, a big part of what we try to do is make sure that we have a solution for each different scenario that should come up. Um, yeah. And okay, so it's a crew of two. You kind of yeah. generally for the custom content. Okay, you, you, you generally answer that. Um, who are, is your normal point of contact on these productions for the custom stuff? Other than I would say production, that's fairly obvious. They should be CC'd on everything. Yeah. CC your producers and coordinators and managers. But is it the VFX guys usually, or um, even the editor on smaller indie stuff that you're interacting with more? That's a good question. I mean, so. We started this 12 years ago, and so in that world, it was more the green screen compositing component. So with that, it was very much the VFX supervisor and, and the post supervisor. Those were the people that were usually reaching out. Now that we're moving into a virtual production world where that's more of a pre-production concern, we're starting to talk more to production coordinators, DPs, gaffers. Um, it really could, uh, even, even art department, because essentially you have to think the plate is now part of the environment. So that's, that could even be location scouts. So we have a touch point with a lot of different places and every different show seems like they've got a little bit different idea of who's responsible for it. More importantly, we just want to make sure that somebody on the show takes charge and recognizes that the plate is important. So many times over the history of this, we find out that the production, sometimes we get a call the night before, they're like, we booked an LED stage for tomorrow and we don't have any kind of content to put on the wall. That gives me heart palpitations thinking about that. Yeah, so that part, that's one of the reasons why the library is helpful is we can actually answer that need. Like, okay, click this button, download this plate, we'll deal with the contract later. Um, that's, a, that's a not uncommon thing for us. Um, so yeah, it, it's... Uh, the most important thing is we want to make sure that producers and, and directors and DPs are starting to recognize that the plate actually is an integral part of, of the world building of the film. Because this is the environment outside the car. Even if it is out of focus, you can kind of tell that that Paris back alley feels like Paris. It's about the aesthetic. So David, do you have uh, pricing for your library assets specifically? Uh, so one of the things we want to try and do with the library is make it very simple. We have a very, very straightforward licensing model. It's $3,500 for the first two minutes. It's half price for every two minutes that comes after that and as part of the same order. So it's kind of a volume discount. Uh, we want to keep that at a price point that is, uh, is, is respectful of lower, uh, lower cost projects. That being said, we also have never turned down a job for price. If you call me up with a passion project that you're like, look, it's me and my friends and we're getting together and we're making a movie, I will absolutely work with you. My entire team are filmmakers. We go off and we shoot our own shorts all the time. We all do indie features. So we understand those needs. I don't want anybody to feel like they're, that, that, that they can't reach out to us. So um, uh, yeah, so we want to keep it, keep it very simple. Now let me put my uh, DP hat on for a moment. One of the first things, rightly or wrongly, we think about beyond lighting, you know, camera, uh, optics. Um, I see a lot of Panasonic cameras around me, which is great if I'm shooting something on, on Panasonic, but generally, do I need to think about cameras matching, say like LFs, other brands, Monsters, Komodos, down this Venice? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, we get it a lot. Um, so everything we're doing right now, um, for the most part, we use a couple of different camera systems, but we definitely are, are Lumix focused. We have a lot of Lumix in the, in the line. Um, and part of it is that we actually, as a company, we came up through the Lumix. So we started with GH2, 
We moved on to GH4, on to GH5S, and now we're on to the BGH1. Uh, and we were honored by Panasonic to have a role to play in developing the BGH1. By the time you've owned a couple of hundred of their cameras, they start paying attention and saying, what do you want in the next generation? So the Probably the first question is, though, what are you guys doing with 800 cameras? And then they, they go, we want your feedback. Yeah, and then they see the arrays and they're like, oh, that's great. Um, so what's nice about the BGH, a big thing for us is street legality because we want to be able to shoot a library out in the real world. So we, if you think 360, as soon as we have ITC, the police in front of and behind us protecting the, they're in the shot now. So it's important for us to be able to shoot without that kind of restriction. So we want to be street legal. Being street legal usually means attaching car, the cameras to a car. In, a, um, in this case, for the Gen 2, it's with suction cups actually on the windshield. We can't go to a heavier camera system because we're going to overstress. Now we're talking about speed rail and big rigging, and we start moving away from uh, a nimble, quick, uh, uh, safe system. So the BGH with lens weighs just over a pound. So I can do 17 cameras, and I'm only at 17 pounds. That's not going to be true if we're doing some of the larger camera systems. Um, but what's amazing with the BGH1, it's number, it's a Netflix A camera approved camera, uh, and and it, that allow you know there's a there's a certain cachet around okay for a DP like yourself they can go okay that we, we I understand what that means there's a, a, a bar of quality that's being met uh, but the main thing about it also for us is its network ability all of the cameras are uh, are on a common computer network it's a standard IP network we can control them all from a small laptop that allows us to actually control the array as one unit instead of a, a multiple of individual cameras so for us it's a it's a tremendous benefit from a technology perspective where we're not having to now fiddle with each individual camera. So there's some of these features, and there's other cameras out there that do a great job, um, but I can say now, having been a part of over 2,000 productions, these cameras are able to match perfectly with all of your A camera. And especially when we're talking about on an LED wall, you have to think about the environment now isn't trying to match the color space of your cinema camera. It's providing the color environment that your cinema camera is recapturing. So it's more about creating a, a very bland, very vanilla, very uncreative environment. So and not to say that the BGH is a bland vanilla camera, but it's able to create a very accurate linear representation of reality, which is what you want on the wall. The creative look is applied by your cinema camera refilming that wall. So I don't want to do too much creative color in the plate because essentially that means I'm doubling the creativity. If you were to put your, say you put your daily slut on the plate, and then you do your daily slut on your cinema camera, your actor's face would get the LUT once, but your environment would be double LUTed. Yeah, I mean, it's just like never stack LUTs. It's kind of a lookup table color. That's just never a good idea. So I kind of get that philosophically. So that's really interesting. Do I, do, and can I kind of tailor the settings that you guys are working with? Obviously, things like frame rate, resolution, et cetera, are great. Okay. Uh, well, David, thank you so much. I really appreciate you walking us around uh, your process. This is a great deep dive. It, it's nice to be able to actually kind of get into the nuts and bolts, and I hope your audience finds it helpful. Cool. We do too. Thanks for watching, guys.